great man. His only mistake was he attacked too early. That's how he lost Waterloo. Oh, now, listen, I don't mind a little teasing, but this is absolutely demoralizing. Well, I give you, Napoleon. You can have him all night. Welcome to Season 2 of How Would Lubitsch Do It? A podcast in which we discuss the works of director Ernst Lubitsch, one film at a time. But not today! It's 1927, and today, Paul Cuff returns to discuss Napoleon Vupar Abel Gantz. Come visit ErnstCast.com if you'd like show notes, resources as to where you might find the films we'll be discussing, or just to say hi. So speaking of films that are all the better for their lack of fealty to history, you're probably the, I mean, I know there's a few guests we've had that love Napoleon, but I would be remiss not to discuss the Abel Gantz epic Napoleon with you as a scholar of Abel Gantz. A little context on where I'm coming at this from, though. Because Paul has not only written a book that I've yet to read because of the impossibility of finding books in Canada, but you also recorded the commentary on the Blu-ray for Napoleon by the BFI of the Photoplay Restoration headed up by Kevin Brownlow. And I've probably mentioned this at some point in my many now four years of podcasting that that Blu-ray set is, I think, maybe the single most essential piece of physical media I own. (laughs) So this is quite an opportunity. But yes, Napoleon, you mentioned this briefly in our correspondence prior to this podcast, but I would love to hear about how you first saw the film, your first experience viewing it, because I can say for my part, Will dragged me literally down to San Francisco in 2012 to watch the version that was shown by Kevin Brownlow at the San Francisco Silent Film Festival. It was a sidebar in Oakland. And that was by a very significant margin, the most incredible experience I've ever had in a cinema. And I'd love to hear about your own experience with it. How did you come across this movie? A friend dragged me to London. (laughs) And I have to say, his name is Nicholas. Hello, Nick, if you're listening. I had never heard of Napoleon, the film. I had never heard of Ebel Gans, the director. All I knew about it was what my friend had told me, namely that it's very impressive, it's quite long, and it has multiple screens. And so from this very nebulous sense of what the thing that I was going to see was, I went down to London, and I have to say I was so close to not going because I think, was it the day before I had watched Peter Watkins' War Game, which, if you've not seen it, is the most unbelievably visceral, horrifying, apocalyptically miserable envisioning of what it would look like if there was a nuclear war in the 1960s. It's incredible, yeah. And the film just emotionally drained me. I felt like nothing. I felt like I just wanted to crawl in bed and never get out of it again. <laughs> and that was the day before I had to go and see Napoleon and put all my energy into going to London and to sitting through, as far as I knew, quite a long film. So I went there. It was the Royal Festival Hall in London. And this was the last time before you saw the film that this version of the film was shown. It remains really difficult to see, I think, properly. But at the time, it was impossible to see except for these very isolated screenings. It was shown very regularly live all over the place in the 80s Mm -hmm. and slightly in the 90s. But, you know, for various reasons, the film was not available for a long time. So, yes, I went there and I started watching it. And then the film started behaving in a way that films should not behave. I had no idea that films could do this. You're watching the screen suddenly start splitting into multiple screens. You're watching the cutting get faster and faster until it literally cannot get any faster when you're cutting single frames together. Mm -hmm. Watching this, I should also say that I'd seen not that many silent films before this point. You know, I'd watched Battleship Potemkin because it's difficult to go through life in any walk of life, I feel, with not having been shown that at some point in history class or whatever. I'd seen Metropolis because I was still, this was my second year at university and I was studying film. So we'd watched Metropolis dutifully in the first year. This is silent cinema, everyone. Mm. We go from the Lumiere brothers to Metropolis and now we'll do some sound, thanks. And, you know, we have our outline. So my impression of what silent cinema was was very limited. And so this film was just, it was sort of beyond anything that I could imagine that I knew cinema could do or had done. You have I think, three intervals through the film that the Brown version is divided into four acts. Yeah. And the end of act one ends with a double tempest sequence where it is both wild handheld camera work and rapid cutting and cutting from amber to blue. And then both the scenes are just mashed and collide at the end into these multiple, multiple superimpositions. And the orchestra is thundering out the themes. And I kind of stumbled. I thought I've never seen a better film. <laughs> I'm not sure I've ever seen a better work of art than this. It reoriented my life, but it reoriented my view of visual culture. Just that first act 
And then obviously something even stranger happened for the last 20 minutes of the film where it tripled in size. Yes, yeah. I have to say that that screening is, it remains one of the most important things that I've ever done or attended. I can only thank Nicholas for dragging me there. My God, I don't think I even paid for my ticket because he bought <laughs> the tickets in advance. I think I offered to pay him back. Said, no, no, no. For free, I had the best experience culturally of my life. And then, of course, I couldn't see the film again properly for nine years, mm -hmm. which I have to say were a very long nine years for me, given that I just found the cultural love of my life and then was immediately, <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can't see that ever again. For me, it was only four years, but those four years feel like decades. Absolutely. Because I was writing my thesis I immediately, as soon as I'd seen the film, I thought, okay, well, it's not enough for me to sit back and watch this film. I have to do something about it. And so the only thing I could do about it was write my undergraduate dissertation on it. So I did the next year. And then I wrote my MA on it, then my PhD on it. And then I wrote a book on it eventually. And then did the commentary as my ultimate act of homage <laughs> or, you know, desperately trying to pay the film back. I don't know if that's a strange way to put it, but I just wanted to pay the film back because it's, it makes me emotional even to try and describe it. Mm -hmm. This was something that I never knew existed. And when I knew it existed, I knew I couldn't live without it. It was one of those genuinely redefining moments for me. When I was writing the PhD, I had, well, obviously the first thing after the screening, I scoured the world for whatever I could find. And eventually I got the utterly grotty looking off-air broadcast from the film was broadcast on Channel 4 television in the UK in 1980. This was the, at that time, full orchestral score, mm -hmm. but obviously via murky depths of VHS sound recorded off-air many years previously and given a dotty transfer to disc. And the best I could upgrade from there was the exact same version, but it was from the original broadcast tapes. So it looked as good as it could. And it had the single screen ending too, right? Yes, it did. Which is its own interesting object. Indeed it is. I mean, it's got more scenes in it or different scenes in it. Mm -hmm. And it was both disappointing and interesting to end the film with my memory being the most spectacular thing and that the final image of the trickler spelled out in waves in blue, white and red on the screen. Mm -hmm. It's one of those images where you think, this is simply one of the greatest images ever projected. This is just such a profoundly brilliant, imaginative, transformative use of images. My God, this man could use images. And you think that last shot just could go on forever. You could eternally loop those breaking waves. Yeah. You'd be in some kind of, I don't know, maybe you're being put to sleep or something. <laughs> That's the image you would have. Just this eternally on the brink of something image going on forever. I find when I see a film that really speaks to me on that visceral level, again, there's only a half dozen or so films that have ever done that for me, ever. And Napoleon is right at the top of that pile. I have a compulsion to deconstruct and recreate it. <laughs> so privately on my YouTube, you know, I've lost the originals long ago, but unpublished, I have a lot of triptychs. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of attempts to just take that scene and go, okay, how can I, you know, I literally have a triptych where I have Richard Spencer getting punched in the face looped <laughs> instead of waves. I also like parodying American right-wingers. <laughs> There's something about that ending where I still feel like we're missing a trick. Yeah, <laughs> as a society that we have not taken the lessons of the last 20 minutes of Napoleon. Absolutely. I have to say, I've done exactly the same thing, but with the missing Double Tempest triptych. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. So I obsessively try to re-edit the footage that exists. You can't do it. You need long duration shots. Mm -hmm. I would love to see if they can reconstruct the original Double Tempest sequence, because again, the idea of having those two spaces intercut across three screens and then mashed together at the end. Oh. Fantastic. Just so I can get straight in my head, that was edited after the Apollo version, or was that new in the Apollo but not the opera? So the opera version, which was the first version that was shown, mm -hmm. that had both triptychs in. Oh, okay, that had both, okay. Yeah, so Gans only planned, and again, I mean, it's mad to think that as the film went along, he was still correcting the script and he didn't know how and indeed when it was going to end. <laughs> and he didn't even reach the end of his first screenplay of six when he reached the end of what he could possibly do in the time and the money and the budget and everything else. He had to end the film. So he scribbled down this notion and made it happen of the three screens for the ending. And then he thought, what a fantastic idea. I should try and do something else in the film with that. So then he went back to the footage from The Double Tempest and reworked it into the triptych version. Mm -hmm. So that's how that sequence was first seen publicly. And then, well, like an awful lot of footage from the film, it was disassembled and never reassembled. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the many aspects of Napoleon which is lost to us. The single screen version of The Double Tempest, I think, is one of the most extraordinarily edited sequences ever. It's just, the film is so kind of alien to anything else around it. You can contextualize it as you can contextualize anything 
in a point in history. But there's a mad hallucinatory energy to it, which I've never encountered to that degree and in that way in anything else. And even in the other most mad experimental film of the time, there's nothing quite as grand, as all-encompassingly mad and beautiful as that film. Film restoration and preservation is such a common theme in this podcast, as you're no doubt aware. And Napoleon represents such a conundrum. Mm. I find myself a bit at odds with aficionados of restoration sometimes because there's this idea of there is a canonical version of a film Mm. that we need to match as closely as possible. That doesn't exist with Napoleon. Yeah. It has no fixed shape. Yeah. It's not a film that we can say was ever canonically nine hours, canonically four hours, or now the longest we have available is five hours and 45 or so. Yeah. And again, we should say that the Cinematheque Francaise is producing or enemy has finished, but has not yet released its new restoration of Napoleon, which I think last time was announced was going to be six hours, 30, six hours, 40 or something. I forget. There'll be more of it. And again, some of that might be different frame rates, but a lot of it was extra footage to a significant degree. And again, it's a film which has always existed in multiple versions. And I feel like the main tension and the main tension that critics have always said about the film is, are you interested in narrative or are you interested in spectacle and effects and all the rest of it? Gauss was wrestling with this problem from the outset when he had however many hundred hours of footage of everything he'd shot, just ludicrous amounts. The sheer physical volume of celluloid was incredible when he just had to go into a warehouse with his editor, Margaret Berger, and Mm. just somehow make this terrifying amount of raw material into something that could be shown. And so his solution at first was essentially to give the film a split identity. He gave it the, you hesitate to call four and a half hours or whatever, short version of the film where it was everything that was technically impressive about the film, he tried to show off. So he didn't just have the one triptych, which he'd planned. He made the second one to make the effect more sustained and also to give that four and a half hours a bit more structure, I think, to give it a balance in terms of how to end that part of the film on a bang. Whereas in a single screen version, you've got a whole bunch of extra scenes afterwards. I think in the opera version, there were no extra scenes after the Double Tempest. You immediately cut to the next epoch of the film. Oh, interesting. Whereas in the Apollo version, you have, so essentially after the storm at sea, Napoleon is then rescued. Yeah, the great sequence of Nelson. Yes, which is fantastic. And I think the breaks were in different places according to which version of the film you watched. So the way to end part one on a high is to end with a triptych and then stop. Mm -hmm. And then resume after your break, as opposed to lead on into more narrative material. The opera version was a four-plus-hour trailer for the film that was coming, which was about 10 hours, the Apollo version. We call that the sizzle reel now. (laughs) It is mad to think of the scale of the film and just trying to make it into a coherent form, even if it was four and a half hours or 10 hours, Mm -hmm. just trying to make it into this thing which he had imagined in his head, which I don't think he ever realized in his life. And he obsessively revisited trying to get this thing, this idea, this emotion, this dream of something in his head out into the world in some format. Those two first versions, the opera and the Apollo version, you can see the technical show-off version and the version which is still technically a show-off, but has the wider, more coherent narrative. And everyone who saw the two versions back in 1927-28, they all said the Apollo version was superior. Mm -hmm. Not just because lots of the technical glitches had been ironed out in between the two versions and the screenings between them. So everything that was technically impressive with the first version was amplified, if anything, in the second version. But it made more sense. Because even with four and a half hours to play with, that is still most of the film is missing in terms of narrative. And so, you know, however long you want your performing edition of Napoleon, as you might call it, to be, to put on a show, to show to people, you have to bear in mind that there is at least 10 hours worth of narrative to play with. So even if you are giving them a most technically perfect, brilliant version, you are denying them a whole bunch of stuff which makes things make more sense on screen. Hmm. I mean, there's lots of ideas about whether, say, a four and a half hour version matching all the editing and everything of the Apollo version is better than the 10 hour version, should it exist, of the Apollo version. So you've got everything technically as Gauss would have wanted, but without all the story. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, you've sort of missed the point there. The point is not just on the micro scale of editing, the Apollo is better. On the macro scale of narrative, it is better, more fuller, more rounded, more interesting, more complex, more ambiguous. The more you put back into Napoleon, the more interesting it becomes. Even if, fine, if you, for example, don't have more than four hours for your screening time allotted to you, show four hours of Napoleon, fine. But you have to see as much of there is of the film as possible to fully understand it. There's always going to be the equivalent of about two feature films worth of material missing. (laughs) Which is just mad to think about. There's always going to be more missing. But more is better. To me, the really remarkable part is that we have it at all. Yes. The film was chopped up into its component parts, used in other movies. Yeah. It was turned into a talkie at one point. Oh. More than one point. Yes. The amount of sources that this film has had to be culled from is monumental. Yes. 
on the note that the two sound versions, or the two, I mean, Goss played around and released various bits of it in various formats throughout his life, but the two official main sound versions, one from 1935 called Napoleon Bonaparte, is terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the version from 1970, 71, Bonaparte and the Revolution, is worse. I mean, I have to say, as someone who spent much of their life inside Goss's head, as it were, trying to understand him, both the sound versions are fascinating because Gauss reuses the footage from the silent film and intercuts it with newly shot footage, for example, for the 1935 version. So in between shots, you watch characters age. And because the version from 1927 was shot at approximately 20 frames per second, Gauss did not have the capacity to duplicate frames, so everything is faster. So in order to then synchronize the voices in 1935 to the characters on screen from 1927, his actors have to talk faster. <laughs> So the actors from 1935 sound and talk like this. And the actors from 1927 talk like that. And you have them intercut. <laughs> yeah. It's technically mad from this man who was the most brilliant technician. It is technically insane that he was trying to do this. It's awful. It's terrible. But it's really interesting. This leads me to a question that I've always had about Abel Gantz. And I don't think there is going to ever be a satisfactory answer to this. But what happened to him after Napoleon? You have his two very high profile features made before Napoleon, Jacques and LaRue, that are, you know, widely celebrated. But after Napoleon, it's almost like he worked for another 30 years, but made nothing of, I guess, wide note. Was there something about the Napoleon experience that fundamentally changed him as an artist? Or what's your take? Well... I suspect this may be a slightly long answer, but <laughs> one of the most interesting things actually to come out in recent years related to Gauss is his correspondence with Charles Pathé, the man who founded Pathé in France. Mm -hmm. And Pathé was the father of the French film industry as it became in the 20s. And they first met in 1918. And Gauss was a fresh, new, up-and-coming talent. He'd made lots of short films that were successful. And they started corresponding after they met, and Pathé quickly latched on to Gons, thinking, well, this man is brilliant, you know, I will give him money, I will give him what he wants, and he will produce something that is interesting. But when you read their letters, it is so apparent that Charles Pathé knew what was coming. He knew that Hollywood was going to dominate the world. He knew that the French, and indeed European as a whole film industry, post-World War I, had simply no capacity to compete. When Gauss was first starting out on his career, Charles Pathé knew it was going to end badly. Mm -hmm. In terms for the French film industry, for the European industry, he knew that America had won. They had won the marketplace. You know, nothing that Europe could ever produce, could ever do, could possibly reverse this situation. But Gauss did not think like that. Mm -hmm. Gauss genuinely thought he could set out and create a European multinational answer to Hollywood. And he thought the films that he was going to make and help produce with others would hold their own against Hollywood and would be able to be exported and shown around the world. And there was a great future. And so there's this extraordinary moment in 1918 when the two men first start corresponding, where Goss is full of unbelievable enthusiasm for the future. And Giles Pathy is very paternal and very supportive, but he's already seen what's coming. So you've got these two very different trajectories going on where Charles Pathy is essentially winding down his empire in the prospect of, right, okay, well, I'm not interested in producing films anymore. What's the point? I will simply turn myself into a distribution exhibition themed company. I mean, I mm. might support things, but I won't directly make the films because, you know, why? We've lost. We have to seek a different model to do what we can to survive. Whereas Gauss wanted to go out and transform I mean, ultimately, the world into a utopia, obviously. <laughs> but he would do that via cinema. And to do that at all, he would need an international basis for making and producing and exhibiting films. And so all of his major films, Jacques, Larue, Napoleon, each one was successively more difficult to make, produce and exhibit. Jacques was an extraordinary success internationally. In the archives, you can actually literally look, I think there are two massive wads of receipts of money coming in from America. And so you can literally go through and watch week by week the money pouring in from the success of Jacques. And Gauss thought, okay, well, this is how we will do it. I've made a very long film. It was four and a half hours at least when it was first shown and released. I've made this film virtually entirely on my own terms, and it was a success. Therefore, I am right. Therefore, I will do this again and again. <laughs> and that's what he did. Whereas Charles Pathé thought, okay, you were lucky, this is good. But then immediately with LaRue, he started not quite getting cold feet exactly, but he could see that Gauss was headed towards an insurmountable problem when it came to trying to release yet another, even longer, even bigger film. Because LaRue was eight and a half, nine hours when it was first shown, first seen. Seven hours have now been, again, unbelievably miraculously reassembled in the restoration of 2019. 
But again, the film was hardly seen abroad in anything like its original format. It has still never been released in America in theatres. Mm. The DVD with an early restoration came out. And already there's a letter that Gauss wrote but never sent to Pathé, which is filled with unbelievable fury that he blamed Pathé as this essentially kind of a father figure who'd betrayed him, mm. who'd not given this young prodigy the best. And so he went into Napoleon with this dual mindset of, I am right and the world is against me. <laughs> and I will make this thing anyway. And when he's writing about it, there's a phrase he used, which is, I hope I'll be strong enough to carry this film. As if the film Napoleon was a cross. And he already started thinking himself in vaguely messianic terms. And so he embarked on Napoleon and put his life's worth of energy into this film. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know anyone who's ever put so much mental, like spiritual, moral energy into a project. You might compare it with Stroheim and Greed, for example. But I think Napoleon is a different breed of film, even though the comparison is kind of interesting and obvious in terms of what happened to it afterwards. And then Napoleon was acclaimed by many critics as, you know, this is an extraordinary work of art. And then it went nowhere. Mm. And even his own the contract he had signed almost guaranteed that he would not have control over how it was shown anything beyond those first screenings. He ended up suing his own distributors, and it was just, it quickly turned into a nightmare. And even though the polling did actually quite well commercially within France, and it was shown abroad, but the real deal was the showing in America. And the showing in America, the film was reduced to 80, 90 minutes, down from 10 hours, and it was just totally, it was nothing to do with it. And having made what you were convinced was the greatest cultural artifact that your cinema industry could possibly produce, but <laughs> having made literally the film you think is possibly the greatest thing ever made, and having that happen to it, and then the crisis of the coming of sound came along. My second book on Gauss is mainly about his catastrophic first sound film, Le Fin du Monde, The End of the World, which was, it's in the title, what happened to it. It was an even worse experience if Napoleon at least produced a good film. Le Fin du Monde was... I don't know if something inside him had broken because of Napoleon already, but if it wasn't broken then, it was broken by Le Fin du Monde. Mm. He became reliant on cocaine during the production, his marriage fell apart, and his producer ended up killing himself. You could not have a more poisonous, appalling production. And at the end of it came a film which he publicly renounced and spent the rest of his life blaming the producer. And he said the producer edited it at night with a janitor on set. All of this stuff was the worst production in the world. Mm. and. Even if he had recovered from Napoleon, he never recovered from Le Fin de Monde. From then on, he would seem like, you know, when you look at his films, they're just like he'd blown a fuse and he never, ever got it back. You get glimpses of it. And I think his talent shows itself in a strange B-movie entertaining way. I would direct people towards Jacques, the remake of the silent version, which he remade in 1937. It was released in 38, which is, I think, the best sound film that he made, probably quite comfortably. It is the most interesting and again, it works best when you don't think of it, okay, well, this is the man who made Napoleon. No, you think this is a talented B-movie director <laughs> who has a really weird, wonderful... The film is sort of awkward and weird and stumbly, and it's got all sorts of problems, but it is so interesting. And it has this mad, weird energy that creeps in across the film. And because it's so technically flawed in many ways, that allows the weirdness to creep in in ways that you don't expect. And then finally, when you get to the end and, you know, the, the dead are resurrected on screen, it just becomes this whole other film. Mm. It's full of wonderful things, even though it's not a very good film, but it also has moments of such incredible emotional intensity that you think you can see Goss is still there somewhere. But again, something has changed and it was absolutely Napoleon that was the turning point, but he was already doomed. This was all going to happen. Even Charles Pathé saw this in 1918. It was always going to end that way. And whether it's Napoleon that did it or La Fin de Monde, I don't think you could be that convinced that you were right, that convinced of what cinema could be and should be, and have that kind of failure, that double failure, first Napoleon and then the real shitter. Mm. La Fin de Monde, the worst possible experience you could have as an artist, right? you know, as a husband, as a human being, you know, appalling, awful for everyone involved. You're never going to be the same after that. And he wasn't. He couldn't be. It feels like he's maybe the most extreme example of that kind of refrain we see throughout history of the filmmaker who makes the ungodly big epic, like the Bondarchuks of the world, yeah. with War and Peace, and never really recovers from that experience. I would also argue maybe a modern equivalent, I think, would be not an equivalent, because I think Abel Gantz is never to be matched in that, nor should be. But someone like Peter Jackson, uh. his experience making Lord of the Rings, I mean, in hindsight, I think that clearly impacted him in ways that he was never the same since. Mm. 
I think someone called it the David Lean effect once uh-huh. where he makes progressively larger films and eventually just you can't go bigger than <laughs> you hit that limit and there's a psychological thing. And then there's the other thing, right? There's that horrible knowledge that you're a genius Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and being unrecognized. There was a really heartbreaking interview that I've been unable to find in a few years from, I don't know if you know of Don Hertzfeld. Oh, yes. Yeah. Animator. Yeah. I think one of the greatest living filmmakers and he made this masterpiece in 2010. It took him three years to make. It's such a beautiful day. And it just went nowhere. Mm. It made a couple very minor ripples in like the art house scene, Mm. but basically did nothing. And there was an interesting interview prior to his recent run of success that he basically said, there's sort of a pain in knowing you've made something great and Mm. that it is going unrecognized. Yes, absolutely. I think there's very few people who can actually say that and not sound like blowhards. (laughs) And he's one of them. I mean, luckily, since then, he made the World of Tomorrow trilogy, which has been nominated for a couple Academy Awards, or at least it was nominated for one Academy Award. And he's doing well. (laughs) He's still a very minor figure in the scheme of world cinema, but there is that torture of knowing, wow, I think I've made something special here. Yeah. Going back to the Pathé Gans correspondence, there's an extraordinarily vicious letter that Gans wrote in 1929. Again, you can literally trace both their lives and careers across the book of correspondence. There was a break in communications in 1927. Gans disappears into the editing of Napoleon in 26, and they don't correspond again for three years. Mm. And it's like, I've been betrayed. I'm not talking to that man. He should have saved me. He should have saved me. And he didn't. And he wrote a letter. It's a heartbreaking and spiteful and extraordinary emotionally raw letter. And he says, okay, well, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to go into production with Le Fandemont. And then he disappears again for three years and they don't correspond. He just plunges into these abysses of failure and then emerges years later in the 40s when Goss is, I mean, absolutely washed up as an artist and he's not been able to make anything like he wanted to. He's had, uh, at best, an inactive, unmemorable war Mm -hmm. because he stayed behind in France and then he went over to Spain for the last couple of years of the war and he came back and he was nobody anymore. There'd been a war. Anything like his dreams of what cinema could be or should be had gone. The world had not become a utopia, obviously. It had become the most terrifying apocalyptic dystopia. And he resumes a correspondence with Charles Pathé, and suddenly they're both transformed into old men looking back on their lives. Mm. And it's this really touching, they're kind of saying, well, yes, you really were great. And yes, you were also great. Isn't it a shame? Mm. And Pathé, who was ancient and was having to dictate his letters and everything, he calls Goss, essentially, you know, I was so proud of you. You're such a great artist. I do hope you get recognition. And Gauss wrote back and says, you know, well, if I was a great artist, uh, you founded cinema as we know it. The world is in your shadow. And it's this lovely ending of these two old men recalling their former greatness. Gauss lived for another 30 years after Pathé died and became ever older and ever more concerned with looking back and revisiting and reworking Napoleon, for example, into yet another version in 1970-71. Mm-hmm. And again, that film starts with Gauss talking to camera, explaining <laughs> what's going on hmm. and saying he's opening his old celluloid cans and speaking to the dead and now the dead are going to speak to you and here is my thought. <laughs> oh, I've never seen that intro. That's incredible. Oh, it's... If the first sound reworking of Napoleon was bad, there are bits of that film which are literally him holding a camera up to the television to film live crowds to then intercut, pretending that is part of the film footage of the French Revolution. (laughs) It's artisanal, homemade grandpa with camcorder intercutting stuff. But then you get flashes from both previous versions of the films. You get other bits of Gauss's television work that he'd done in the 60s. And then you have Gauss in his late 70s replaying Saint-Just who he played first when he was in his early mid-30s. Oh my gosh, I need to see this. It's Well, it would sort of be a shame if this were available, uh, not the 27 <laughs> Napoleon, but it was briefly online broadcast on French television at some point. Either way, there was a version out there you could see. And so you get Gans as a, I think he was 79 when he shot it, and he's in a silhouette at the end of a corridor. And he's speaking, and it's the silhouette of an old man, and it's the voice of an old man. Mm -hmm. And he's pretending to be someone who died when they were in their (laughs) mid-twenties. It's like the most absolute, transcendently stubborn refusal to engage or to admit reality has reached this point. Mm. The idea is so powerful that reality must rebend itself to suit the sheer will of willing himself to be this 24-year-old man giving a lecture, that even as a 79-year-old, he will go out in front of the camera and film himself and do this speech. And then, of course, when he steps back into the next scene, it's gone in 1925 on set. <laughs> and so you get this old man walking slowly off camera. And then suddenly it's Abel Gons in 1925 and he's shouting and gesturing and everything is sped up and he's talking fast. And then his voice comes. And it's just the intercutting between eras. Gans is literally trying to reconcile himself to his past in the film. Mm. You literally watch him 
trying to reinsert himself into his own past and try and make the past and the present somehow coalesce. So it's fantastically interesting, even if it is an abominably bad film. It's all over the place. Mm. Literally just footage from all over the place. Well, you sold me on tracking it down. Oh, man. You'll want to shuffle through large portions of it. The bits of it are just so plain strange. Mm. Really hauntingly, yeah, someone trying to make reality conform to the idea that's in their head when it cannot be done, but doing it anyway. That sounds fascinating. Now that we're talking about this in year 2023, I kind of set some of my opinions on the restoration of this film when I didn't know as much about how restorations worked, right? Mm -hmm. Where, for example, I watched in 2012 the masterpiece that is the Brownlow Gantz Davis version. Mm -hmm. For example, the Carl Davis score is one of my most cherished pieces of music ever. Yes. I will forever associate with this yeah. movie because I think it's perfect. It's soaring. I have a whole rip of the six hour film in my <laughs> streaming that I just listen to occasionally. Yeah. And so it's close to my heart. And the story of how that restoration came together, which is well told in Brownlow's book. And then there's this new version, the French Cinematheque version, that has been teased for decades, basically. Yes. Decades yeah. and decades. And it's always imminent. Netflix got involved. It's imminent. And it's still imminent in 2023, apparently. Yes. To provide some context, I always thought it was weird that there was one British restoration in the film, one French restoration in the film. And I always thought, why don't they just combine it? The ultimate, <laughs> you know, that was me being naive 22 year old when I first saw the film. It's clear that it doesn't work that way. So I'm kind of left with both really excitement and anticipation that great, we're going to get a six and a half hour version. It's going to be great, but also dread mm. because for 10 years I've clung to this canonical in my mind. It doesn't mean it's actually canonical, but canonical to me version of the film. I can't separate out my love of the film with the love of Davis's score and the way that this version of the film made an impact on me. What are your thoughts on the whole situation we find ourselves in where we're going to soon, hopefully soon, knock on wood, within the next decade, yeah. <laughs> have competing available, hopefully, restorations of the film? I've reconciled myself to the fact that it was a great privilege of my life to feel somehow connected to the film. And I feel that my connection to it has been broken in some way by the fact that now there's the new kid on the block has arrived. Mm -hmm. I have nothing to do with it. I will not have anything to do with it because they won't ask me because I'm not French, because it's their thing. There's no way I'd be doing an equivalent comedy track or anything like that. It is outside of my life somehow. And that is on one level exceedingly sad, even though I am unbelievably excited at the idea of it. And I will watch and listen to it with unbelievable enthusiasm. And the extracts that I have seen look phenomenal and are already subtly but deeply different from versions that I've seen and to the better. Mm -hmm. Everything seems the greatness dial was turned up to 10 or well, they've turned it up to 12. You thought this film was great before? My God, everything is going to be sharper, better, fuller, rounder, everything. And I feel like I sort of reconceptualized in my mind that I think it is a healthy way of looking at it, that all versions of Napoleon are to some degree performing editions, that there is no such thing as a definitive version, and that all of the ones that have been made are made very often for specific purposes, sometimes even in Gonsu's case, for one particular screening of one particular theatre. So I feel like the BFI Blu-ray is a fantastic monument and tribute to the work that Brownlow and Davis and David Gill and Patrick Stanbury, everyone who worked on it at some point in their lives, produced. It's a record of all that work. But that does not necessarily mean it should be canonized as the version of Napoleon. I'm absolutely in your camp. I cannot imagine a better score than the Carl Davis one. It understands the film so well. It is such an intelligent score, as well as packing an incredible emotional punch. The moment when the child Napoleon is sitting on the cannon and the eagle comes back and lands mm -hmm. and the orchestra swells into his theme is an astonishingly, a surprisingly powerful emotional moment. And it will be difficult to see that scene with a different lovely orchestral score. And I think there will be a sense of the great majority of film scores written in the 1920s, for example, or in the 1910s, because, you know, they didn't have the advantages of endless technical tweaking and digital replays, all the technological assistance that you get now as a composer writing music. There's a certain sense of distance between the music and the image. Often the score might seem to or feel to float over the film. Mm-hmm which can be very interesting and moving in its own way. And I sense that, again, only from the extracts that I've seen, that the new score, which again is being assembled from the existing repertory of classical music, both from the period and supposedly going everything from Mozart to Penderecki, and Penderecki only died not that long ago. Oh my gosh. 
So it's going to go beyond the historical range either that the film was citing or was available at that time to composers in the mid-1920s. It is going to feel a bit colder because a lot of the music is going to be from the early 20th century and early 20th century modernism is not 19th century romanticism, nor is it 18th century classicism. It will have a very different tonal feel. I don't know if you have had the chance to hear the extracts from the 1991 or 92 of the Marius Constant score. No, I haven't heard that one. This was a previous French restoration. Again, they've always been perfectly understandably wanting to have their own score for their own version and to have ownership of what is, for many reasons, an exceedingly French film. The rights for France are owned by the state, as I understand it. So, you know, it is, for all sorts of reasons, an independent restoration. And so the first time this tried to happen and was produced was the early 90s. And so Marius Constor, who was a pupil of Honegger, who was the composer who assembled the music for Napoleon in 1927, he was charged with assembling a score with as much Honegger as possible, but interpolating his own music to bridge the gaps where it was impossible to find music for it. Mm-hmm. And Honegger was a modernist, he was a pioneering composer, but his music is not emotionally engaging in the same way as, for example, Davis's use of Beethoven and composers of the era of Napoleon is. It's a very different sound world, it's a cold sound world, it's a harsher, more dissonant sound world. And Napoleon is a very, very different film viewed through that lens of music in circa 1927. Mm -hmm. And so I think the new restoration will have something more of a feel of, it'll be a chillier film. (laughs) I think it'll also probably be a less fun film. Not that many composers working in the 1920s or similarly did fun in the same way that others might have. I mean, I'd love to hear music of the period used for it, and I think it'll be fantastically interesting to hear, but I think it will have a very different emotional effect. Mm -hmm. Having particularly seen and heard the restoration of Gonsi's La Rue, which has the original orchestral score reassembled, and this was music which Honegger, again, he had written some original music for, but actually not that much. Most of it was music which was picked by himself and Paul Foss, who was the musical director of the uh, Gaumont Palace in Paris, where La Rue was shown. So between them, they arranged music and picked music, possibly and possibly not with Gauss's involvement. It's a bit ambiguous as to how much say Gauss had over what music was chosen. And stretches of the score that was brilliantly reassembled by Bernd Tevis, a German composer, and reorchestrated and everything. Parts of that have a phenomenal musical visual impact, like really amazing. Mm -hmm. It works so, so well. And other parts, the music glides over the film and there's a distance created and a couple of beats that, you know, I obsessed myself with LaRue because I could get hold of more of it than I could get hold of Napoleon back in the day. And so I rebuilt my own LaRue and scored it with bits of CD music that I had. So I had a whole different sound world in my head. I'm so proud of what I did with LaRue. You know, bits of it really worked for me. So hearing it with a completely different musical mindset was fascinating. And I love the score. And I think the 2019 reconstruction, the last part of the film. The film is in four parts, each part the length of a feature film in its own right. The last part is just a strange, incredibly beautiful film to look at, but also to listen to. And the musical choices are so, so interesting. Mm. So I think the new French version, which I don't know if they're using any Honegger, which seems mad if your project is to recreate music of the 1920s, that you're not using, say, music from the 1920s written by the man who wrote the original score. Mm. But I've not heard Honegger's name mentioned as being one of the composers cited in the new score. Interesting. Oh, that's so fascinating. I've only heard a few minutes, so I have very little to go on. But enough music survives that you would think they would want to use it, even if they have to heavily rework it to match the editing and all sorts. I have mixed emotions, but beyond anything else, I'm simply thrilled that Napoleon is still alive and bigger, longer, (laughs) more beautiful to look at than ever. (laughs) I'm happy that there is this thing that I have no involvement with that is coming along that will instantly outmode my life's work in one sense it will make everything that i've done seem like just a kind of oh and now this new thing arrives and i know i couldn't possibly redo everything i've done so far in terms of writing Mm -hmm. but i will want to say more and i will have to summon the energy to do that and i look forward to that challenge because whatever's coming will be magnificent in its own way i'll say that i have a couple of napoleon related things in my head that i want to I have no idea if the restoration is ever going to come up again. It's just it's so ludicrously long. It's been delayed so many times. They've missed the bicentennial of Napoleon's death, which would have been 2021. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was supposed to be 2017, then it was possibly 2021. Yeah. 
And now it's 2023 in big air quotes. Yes, but probably 2024 for the actual internet or, you know. Yeah. I mean, even that, I have no idea what the Royal Art is going to be. The viewable version. <laughs> if I was a betting person, I would say 100th anniversary of 2027. You know, let's do it. Oh, yeah. I'm an avid fan cutter. Mm-hmm. In that I will take different, like I did it with my Darling Clementine with the preview and the theatrical tried to make a better looking version. I did it with Chunky Express. I did it with The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, which ended up with Kino finally releasing a decent version, mm. partially because of the fan cuts people had done. Yeah. I dread the prospect of wanting to make a fan cut of <laughs> this dang thing where it's like you recut the upgraded versions of the new version mm. to match the Davis score. That sounds like a months long challenge, oh, but yes. maybe I'll have to do it. I'm sure people will at some point, and it will probably be a hundred years from now, someone will dare to write a legal history of Napoleon. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I would love to read that book, but no one would possibly dare even set about doing that at this minute. Yeah. Part of the reason why we don't know when the French version is going to be released is because how and when and the wherefores and the legalities of it being released internationally in different territories is unknown outside, presumably, a few people who probably themselves don't even know at this point what is going to happen when it's released. So much is yet to be determined in all sorts of ways. And I would love to have time and distance enough to be able to read an account of how this version came about. No kidding. I mean, my other kind of Gantz related project that I promised myself I'm going to do one day is for me, the director I've wanted to do a podcast about most in my life is Ernst Lubitsch. And that's what we're doing today. No coincidence. Oh, yes, we are. Yes. <laughs> Extensively, we were. But one day I'm going to do a podcast. Maybe I'll do a film formally one, which is our old podcast about film techniques. I kind of want to do a miniseries about Napoleon someday. Mm and do like a separate episodes on the craft of different parts of the film, the restoration history, and also if I can get people to talk about it, the legal history, because, oh my gosh, (laughs) it took me months to get a grapple on (laughs) of reading various sources and trawling internet forums, looking up old Robert Harris posts to figure out what the hell happened to this film in the past 50 years, because it's fascinating. One of the many things that Goss made problems for himself back in the day was never having control over his film. Mm -hmm. And so the control over Napoleon is itself a whole other history. It was always going to happen, given the way in which Gauss set out. Charles Pathé would have known this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Back in 1918, he would have said, this is always going to happen. You're going to lose control of this. He wouldn't have known that, you know, over 100 years later, people were still going to be fighting over who has the right to make it, to show it, to own it, to tweak it, to score it, whatever. It's crazy. In our own small way, we got around it briefly. We did a quote-unquote private screening at a local film house where we just showed the Blu-ray and then a private show, but we shared the cost of it with 30 friends. <laughs> so <laughs> that was our way of doing our own little Vancouver screening. A week after the Blu-ray came out, we had it planned. But yeah, it's fascinating. I will never forgive Coppola <laughs> for certain parts of this. Yeah. If he'd had his way, I would never have seen Napoleon. Yeah. Because the screening I was at was under legal threats and it wouldn't have taken place. And, you know, I'm sure I would have had a great life without Napoleon, <laughs> a full of fulfilled life. Much better with it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there's a chance that I would never have seen it and still not have seen it now. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) The effort to make sure that version was not seen and shown, you know, it cuts deep for all sorts of reasons. Mm -hmm. I won't go into all my thoughts on this because I'm sure that it's very uncouth. I completely echo what you said. It's amazing that it's, I mean, maybe this is a good way for me to tie up the conversation a bit. It's amazing that even if it's just locked to region two, Mm. there's the BFI Blu-ray of this. It is available. I have personally imported three copies in my life. (laughs) Three copies that I have given to people. You two can import it if you're listening to this and you can listen to Paul talk over this movie for six hours and it is worth every minute of it. Um, I did it this week. I know that it's probably funny to end an Ernst Lubitsch podcast episode with a plug for a Region 2 Blu-ray of uh, an Abel Gantz film, <laughs> but you only live once. So that's everyone's required reading for this week. Fantastic. <laughs> In so many ways, it is an object that will forever be out of reach. So anything that is even slightly remotely within reach to do with it, grab it. Actually, speaking of out of reach, I'm sure you know about this, but there's the special feature on the Blu-ray where they cut up the final triptych into three individual screens. Ah, so you can watch, if you put your screens together. If you have three copies or you copy it to three hard drives, you can put three screens together. And as long as you can deal with the left and right mats in some way, you can recreate the triptych. I've always wanted to somehow get three projectors and show it properly. It's one of the many curiosities about the film is that technology still now, nothing is geared to show this film properly. You have to go to extraordinary efforts To watch the image shrink even slightly for the sake of the triptych is so, so disheartening. It's disheartening. Yeah. 
Actually, we were lucky enough to run into Kevin Brownlow after the screening of the film in 2012. Uh, we stuck around a bit because we were like, maybe we'll run into someone. And we actually <laughs> ran into him after. And he talked to us about how hard it was to punch three holes in the Paramount Theater wall. Uh, they had to actually basically make two new projection booths for that screening. Oh, wow. And then we actually followed one of the symphony players down and met Carl <laughs> Davis after as well. So that was a very special day for me. But even just showing it on 35, it's an almost impossible film to exhibit unless you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars retrofitting a space on 35, yeah. somehow converting it to three screens. So I've seen Napoleon live, God, how many times? A few times. The 2004 screening is the one, it was my first encounter with it. It was probably the least satisfactory in terms of my memory. I obsess about getting seats in advance, so I like to sit quite close, right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Not too close, but just in the perfect seat. And so I was able to, I had many years to set up the opportunity to do it again. So in 2013, when I invited a whole bunch of friends, <laughs> and then that was the warmest, the happiest showing of Napoleon I've been to when it was finally able to be shown again. And this was 2013. So this was after it was shown for you in 2012. And that was the happiest. And then the next year, 2014, was the best screening that I've been to because it was in Amsterdam and it was in a place called the Zigo Dome, which was a pop concert stroke. I mean, God knows what else they use it for, like a massive, massive, vast space. The combined width of the triptychs at the end were 40 meters. Oh my gosh. And I was sitting almost uncomfortably close <laughs> and I thought I was going to have a heart attack when the three screens came on. It was like being enveloped by these images. Mm. My heart was beating so fast, I thought it was literally trying to rip itself out of my body and hurl itself at the screen. I have never had an experience like that. It was just, just like the power of images. However you watch it, you will get a sense of that. But having it just literally, I couldn't get back far enough in my seat. Mm -hmm. I could see it all, but I didn't know what to do with it. It was so big, so powerful. It was just, ah, oh, yeah. Our screens were definitely not quite that big, but it had a similar effect. I've always said it was larger than IMAX. Mm. The whole theater was flooded with light. That's what I remember best is that when the triptych came on and you had the tricolor at the end, mm. it bounced light back at the audience. So uh. the audience was illuminated with blue, white, and red. Uh. That was one of the most phenomenal experiences I've ever had in my life. Yeah, gosh. I've never quite been able to put adequately into words. And I like trying to put things into words. The act of writing and reacting. And I've never been able to put adequately into words the feeling and the thrill of that sequence in particular in that film. But again, I feel like I can spend my, and I probably will spend my whole life trying to write about that film and never quite conveying the beauty of it. Otherworldly, like this film has landed from another planet, from another age, just leaping out at you. And it's such an extraordinary thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think I will ever get tired of seeing it or thinking about it or writing about it, but knowing that I can never quite reach its level. There is no language other than its own to discuss it. Yeah. There is no other media in which I can replicate or convey or reflect or articulate its own essence. You just have to watch it because it has its own life and nothing that I can do can ever quite reach it. And that's why it's so wonderful. It's just, oh, it's such a good film. <laughs> Well, I can't top that. I think that's a great way for us to close out that conversation. Thank you so much for making the time to wax poetic <laughs> with me about what still might be my favorite movie ever made. Thank you for inviting me. And I hope back in the past somewhere, we were talking about Lubitsch and that part of the podcast is, is viable <laughs> and informing and entertaining. Oh, yes, certainly. I hope the lubitsch Gauss balance is adequate. <laughs> <laughs> right now, actually, I'm wrestling with the Sumerian episode. Uh, we haven't recorded this yet. I think this is the third to last episode. I haven't recorded the Wildcat or Sumerian from this season, so it's like the middle stuff. Wildcat is going to be easy. That film's lovely. Mm -hmm. But Sumerian, I'm trying to kind of figure out a way to talk about that movie because I don't want to subject any guests to it. Yeah, I almost feel like the only way is to talk about other Orientalist films or other fantasy films. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to talk around it. See, and here's the other thing is we also covered that with Chris Kristen Thompson. Ah. So it's like we have a better Orientalist conversation <laughs> with her because she's also an Egyptologist, yes. which is incredible. She had to do that episode. It was like custom built for her. She was the one yeah. person in the world qualified to do that episode. And I'm so happy we got her for that. This episode is on I mean, my other Dodge episode, oh. where as soon as I saw that you were both a fan of Anna Bullen in your own way <laughs> and also a fan of Napoleon, I'm like, great. <laughs> and I could smuggle in an Abel Gantz mini episode into my Anna Bullen episode. This will be great. That was my evil plan. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Paul. Thank you very much for having me. Next week, Bron Reuter and Will Ross join us to discuss The Wildcat. Gloria Mercer was our dialogue editor for this episode. Head over to www.ernstcast.com for links to the various public domain films we'll be discussing this season and other resources such as show notes. 
How Would Lupage Do It? is a production of Moving Image Agency. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on whatever podcast service you happen to use. We'd like to acknowledge that this podcast was produced on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples.